Hello again. Hi. Let me get the meeting notes up. I already copied the template over for you. Thank you. I realized that when I had adjusted the page margins to close one of the tickets, it screwed up the table formatting. So then I had to oh. fix the page margins again. <laughs> it was a nightmare. <laughs> Let's see. You know, I, I like, I, I've seen a couple of places use HackMD and I really like those. I like I like the concept behind it. It's just like so part of the problem that I've been seeing with Google Docs is the more editors or the more content that you have or that you make changes to, it gets like these ghost things in it that you can never find and fix. Ghost things? Yeah, like weird formatting problems that take forever to try to track down. So today dealing with the margins and the table stuff. That was insane. I had to like undo a bunch of things, but um, it kind of makes me wonder if we we should look at something else. I mean, I'm I'm okay with Google Docs, but I'd also like to encourage people to contribute content, and we rate things in Markdown for our repo, so HackMD made sense. Yeah, yeah, I like the HackMD a lot as well. Hey, everyone. Right, we are gonna just wait a couple of minutes. Um, uh, we have Bob here. Hey, Bob. Okay, hey, Brendan, here. How are you? Great. Uh, let's see. Morning, all. Okay, it looks like we have all the speakers on. That's a that's a good start. <laughs> awesome. Um, do, do I have audio? Yes, we can hear you now. Right, okay, new machine and a quick Zoom install and awesome. Panic over drivers and mics. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm surprised you got that working on the new system. I feel like uh, yeah. usually when you install Zoom for the first time, you run into five different problems. Sure. All right, I'm going to put in the meeting notes um, in the chat. If you could just sign in by putting in your names and um, if you have any updates or if you're new, um, put down your organization or you know what you do so that people that are interested in the topic can reach out if, if they want to have a chat. Brandon, I've been hearing from quite a few folks who see the meeting agenda, but they're they're not really clear. They're new to the SIG. They might have not read the charter. What is it that we do at SIG Security? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let's um let's talk a little I guess yeah, let's see what we can do for that. Um maybe Andrews, could you open an issue? <laughs> I can open an issue. That's that's one of the things we we do here. In this space <laughs> for all, all cloud native security things. Yeah, that's a, man, many of the things we do here. Just open issues. <laughs> we work in issues too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we also need a uh, uh, scribe to, if you don't mind helping out, that would be great. I closed a bunch of issues last week. Yeah, Emily's on the on the top of the scoreboard right now. I've I've been getting so much email in my Gmail. Okay, so uh, I think let's get started with kind of a, a round going through. Let's see. Um, all right, we have an update from Jonathan. Jonathan, do you want to take? Sure, just a very, very brief one. So, so we've had a couple of additional conversations on the back of the presentation on supply chain security and software factory last week. And uh, we've uh, agreed with the 
chance to start up that working group. And the first meeting of that is tomorrow at 4.30 EST. Uh, I'll be putting the invite. Uh, thanks for Emily for sending through the details for that. So I'll be putting the invite into the GitHub and the uh, chat channel as well. So come along to uh, be part of that if, if, in, if of interest. That's it. Thanks. Great. Emily. Thanks, John. All right, so I think that's all the updates we have for today. So I think we should just go ahead. Uh, we have a good, pres a great presentation today on recall. Um, and I think um, we have Luke, Bob, and Don, I believe that will be bringing us through that today. So um, I think let's go ahead with that. Cool, okay, we'll do a quick introduction. That's okay. So I'm, I'm Luke Hines, I work at Red Hat in the CTO office and I've been working around the security space for quite a while. Last time I was here, I presented Keyline, which has since then onboarded as a, a sandbox project. And uh, I'll go over to uh, let me, uh, Bob. Hey everybody, Bob Calloway also with Red Hat in the uh, CTO's office. And Dan. Uh, hey, hey, I'm Dan Lawrence. Uh, I'm at Google. I've been in the CNCF Kubernetes space for a while on projects like Minikube and <clears throat> Kubernetes, and I've gotten more into the security supply chain space recently. Awesome. So it's all three of us that are working on uh, recall. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, just give me a second. Let's just go for desktop. Allow Zoom to share your screen. Open, okay, hold on, security. Okay, sorry, I've got a some sort of sandbox. Just so me, you thought on. you could get away from Zoom. Problems. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> Zoom, oh, here we go. Um, Zoom.us will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit, okay. Dan, are you okay to present? I had to quit Zoom to uh, refresh the permissions. Yeah. Oh, let good me, stuff. Let me try. I have to use the web browser, not the desktop app, because I have restrictions too. If not, Bob will have a copy, so we should be able to do it between the three of us. Is it possible for you to just mime it out? Or is that <laughs> too much? Good day. Let's see. Is it problematic, Dan? Um, sorry, I think it's going to work. Okay. Just my internet's being a little slow. There we go. Okay, something's instantiating. So. Uh oh, we're supposed to see something. Yeah, it's uh... it's a bit of it's a white screen at the moment. You want to have a try, Bob? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, Dan. Mine says it's sharing. I uh, something is no, not yet. We see the white screen again. Luke, do you think it might make sense for you just uh, quit and then rejoin? Could do that, yeah. I'll jump off. In the meantime, you, you folks might have some luck. Okay. Oh, we got it. Oh, uh, soon you left, it came up for me. Yeah. We'll give him a minute. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll bang him. Can you move the slide just to make sure it's it's updating as well? Okay, yeah, it, it works. Cool. All 
All right. Okay. I think we'll right. Back. Good. Okay. So, yeah, so this is Project Recall. As said earlier, it's myself, Dan and Bob that have been working on this. We've been kind of under the radar for a bit and sort of pathfinding as we go along with the technology. And, and uh, we're, we're at the stage now where we're entertaining a soft launch as such and starting to share this with subject matter experts to get uh, feedback on what their impressions are, possible collaborations and, and alignment and so forth. So um, do you want to skip to the next slide? Okay, uh, you folks, you're all, you all have expertise here. I don't need to explain this, but you, we all know that software supply chains have their, uh, their, their weaknesses. So there's um, various attacks, uh, forwarded attacks, freeze, replay attacks, so forth. Keys get compromised. Uh, SSO accounts get compromised, which allow people to then piggyback onto systems such as GitHub, Jira, so forth. Malicious hashes, so we all remember the Linux Mint attack where somebody swapped out an ISO and put their own uh, digest, their own MD5 digest onto the site and then something like 10,000 people downloaded it. I don't need to give you folks a scare story. You're, you're all experts in this domain, but it's, it's a problem that we're all aware of. And, and um, Recore is developed to be conducive towards trying to help to solve this problem. Okay, so if we go to slide three. So we sort of agreed amongst ourselves that we could do with some form of transparency, okay? Not an arbiter on whether something can be trusted or non-trusted, but a, a, form, a, a level of non-repudiation around what is the truth, okay? And uh, particularly for cases where somebody's private key signs artifacts, okay? Somebody perhaps signs a release of some sort, uh, keys are compromised, okay? So what is the blast radius? Uh, somebody has claims to have signed a release or a binary. And, uh, and then the, the old sort of targeted attack is everybody seeing the same as me. So when I go to retrieve what I believe to be the latest version of a piece of software, am I seeing the latest version that everybody else is? Or am I seeing an older version, somebody's uh, rendering the optics so that I see an older version that you know has some nasty CVEs in in the uh, uh, with, within that particular release. So this sort of sets the stage for why we started to explore this project. Uh, Dan, I think you're going to get four. We're going to do a bit of a tag team here as we go through the slides. Sure. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a, a zoom in on the one point Luke made above. Um, one of the biggest benefits of having kind of signature transparency here in a transparency log is the ability to detect key compromise. So if you're using something like PGP to sign release artifacts, one of the biggest problems is knowing whether or not your private key has ever been compromised or whether it's um, still secure. Um, if it's been compromised, somebody might have it and they might be signing things on your behalf and distributing them. Um, so this is kind of how a transparency log, uh, the three different groups here, the transparency log itself, you as a software publisher and a user can kind of work together to help detect a key compromise. Um, and it kind of relies on everyone trusting and verifying each other. Uh, it's similar to the certificate transparency story, if you're familiar with how that works. But every time you sign an artifact that you're going to distribute, you would publish that signature to the ReCore transparency log, and you would instruct your users to check that log before trusting a signature from you. Um, at the same time, you're monitoring the entire transparency log for any signatures added to it with your public key. Um, and then you compare that with an internal list of things that you think you've signed. If anything ever shows up in that log that you don't remember signing um, or you don't think you've signed, then you know that your key uh, has probably been compromised and it's time to rotate and get a new one and uh, instruct your users that, any, that those particular signatures um, aren't to be trusted. So it also helps you control the blast radius there a bit. It's back to you, Luke. Is this, um, whose slide was this? Um, okay, so this is just an example of you know, where people have found PGP to be problematic. One of the projects we were talking to recently, you can see they had an issue at the bottom where they had an issue with their computer needed to create a new key. And this particular project requires that you 
uh, import about 20 public keys into your GPG to validate the signing of a release. And these are all people that have all left the project. You know, so um, it's, it's sort of, it just goes to show how there is a, it's less than an ideal situation. So slide six, I can see is empty, but I can, I can do this one by mouse, so to say. So I, I was meant to put something in here. So anybody that's not familiar, um, I'll go for it quick because I'm pretty sure you all are what a transparency log is essentially a, a structure called a Merkle tree. Okay. And a Merkle tree is a, a components are, are hashed and then those hashes are concatenated together and a hash is created again. And it builds like a, a pyramid, a tree structure all the way up to an eventual root hash. And then you can do things such as inclusion proofs. So you can make you can you can validate that there is an entry within the Merkle tree. So it's used by blockchain to sign transactions. Uh, Git has a type of Merkle tree, okay, and also BitTorrent. So BitTorrent they they split the file into multiple parts. They hash those parts. Those go out, and then as people receive those file parts, they can validate that they're uh, tamper free by computing the, uh, the Merkle tree. So that's essentially a transparency log. And, and this is what Recall's built on top of, is a transparency log. And, and we're using the same backend as that which is used for certificate transparency, which is run by Cloudflare, Google, Facebook, various people. So uh, slide seven. So yeah, Project Recall, we kind of touched on some of this, but just to reiterate, it's, this is centered on the software supply chain transparency services. Uh, we have a public instance that's available and people are testing against. And we're looking to have this as kind of like a public good corporation. That's one of the models that we're receptive to. So think let's encrypt essentially. Uh, we have um, server code and uh, client code. This is all developed in Golang along with our back end which we use for the Merkle tree, which is a project called Trillium. And you can have a public instance, but you could also stand up a, an internal instance. So if somebody wanted their own internal transparency log, then that's, you know, that's very viable. You, you can do that. Now, once instances are built, they can be completely audited by what we call a, a monitor. So a monitor is a system that will <clears throat> pop entries as they come off the log, uh, they will validate the integrity of the Merkle tree and, and verify that it's of a, a sort of a tamper free state. So this is again along the lines of this is nothing new that we've invented. This is how a certificate transparency project operates as well. So if we go to slide eight. So with Recore, we're not trying to um, be an actor as such, okay, in, in the way of, say, for example, Tough with how to um, take actions against the key compromise or, uh, you know, or, or notary or any of the projects around this sort of domain. All we are is we're looking to provide a, the, the uh, immutable backend for storing of, of these data sets, okay? And to be able to do that, we have what we call a pluggable PKI interface. So when these manifests are signed, you as your, we can uh, have custom signing interfaces. So one that we use typically as an example is GPG, but we also have X509 and mini sign, which I believe is from free BSD. Is that right, Dan, Bob? Mini sign? Sort of, sort of. Yeah, um, yeah sort BSD of. uses, uh, they use a separate tool called sign, signify, mini sign is another version of it that's compatible. Uh, okay. Yeah, so mini sign signifier, kind of the same thing. Understood, yeah. But essentially, it's like a driver. It's a pluggable interface, okay? And then the same comes for the actual manifests, okay? So we we're talking typically JSON here, okay? Uh, you can effectively customize and have your own value sets in there. So we're not tied into any particular standard as such. We've got, we've got the, the agility there is to, to, uh, to make a pull request with your own framework. And, and, and include that into Recall. So that way, you know, like I say, we're not fixed to any particular type. 
the, the, the flexibility there is to, to customize it accordingly. So if we go to slide nine, uh, so this is an example manifest. We call this the, the recall type. Actually, we call them types. I should, I should uh, make that clear. So as you can see, there's a, an API version, there's a spec. So we have a format where we've got the sort of a sign-in system that we use. Uh, the URL, in this instance, it's a signature. Uh, the public key, okay. And then we have sort of a value such as data. So here you can see there's a release and there's a sign-in of that release. Now there, there is a client-side CLI that will generate this manifest for you. So developers could quite easily just pass in some arguments of their public key, the signature that they've just generated for release, and then an artifact, i.e. a toggle. So that could be locally on their machine or it could be on a uh, a sort of an, an external facing system, okay? And then what Keyline will do is it will receive this manifest, it will validate it, and then it will ensure the sign-in is correct before we let it come into the sort of log, okay? Uh, we, we don't change the data that goes into the, to the log as such. All we do is we make sure that it's not nonsense that somebody's signing this. It's actually signed by the key, the key that it's, it's claimed to be signed by. So um, as I say here, we've got this sort of generic example that we have that we use. And uh, this will work with um, Intoto, for example. And, uh, but we also can uh, utilize XML and YAML. So we're not sort of locked into any particular manifesting type. And then if we go to slide 10, so you see this kind of goes back to the Merkle tree, which I described earlier, okay? And um, so the, the manifest is hashed into the tree and then we can calculate a root hash effectively for, for an inclusion proof assigned tree hash. Okay, um, if we go to 12, so this is a, a kind of very, very high level architecture. I'm sorry, there's a bit of stuff on the slides I should have been cleaning up. Uh, you can see to your left, you have your creators, so developers, build systems, tools. Okay, so that could be the likes of, uh, for example, Notary or Intoto. You then have um, your auditors, which are people that would monitor the log. Okay, so these could typically be package managers, uh, security researchers, somebody like a showdown.io, effectively, uh, antivirus vendors, so forth. And then clients would be software users or consumers of software modules and libraries. So they could then use Recore as a means to ensure there's not a sort of forwarded attack underway. Okay, if we go to um, slide 13. So quite often we get asked, why not blockchain? Okay, uh, we're, we're fans of blockchain, but what we found is that most public use or, or uses that we know of blockchain, they end up sticking a gateway in front quite a lot of the time for canonicalization, validation, speed, authentication, and so forth. And transparency logs out of the box, they work for what we want them to do. And as said, Trillion is kind of tried and tested. It's deployed and used at large scale. So it's used for certificate transparency, uh, for GoSum and uh, you know, it's the likes of, uh, as I said earlier, Google run a transparency, stick a transparency server as do Cloudflare and various others as well. So if we go to slide 14. So we are effectively cloud native. Recall can run on Kubernetes. We have an operator and uh, that we've actually got code that's available for um, instantiating on, on Kubernetes as well, the various YAML files that are needed. And then if we go to project status, so as I said, we're currently in soft launch. So we have a public instance that's available. Uh, we now have no guarantees around it. It's, it's a case of, uh, it's a sandbox at the moment that people can play with. And then we're kind of, we're sort of kind of in an alpha stage still. So, you know, there might be bugs that require us to uh, drop data and make fixes and so forth. Although we're confident we won't need to do that, but we just need this sort of bedding in period effectively. 
And we're seeking to onboard projects to start adding entries to Recall. Uh, there, we're doing some integration with Fedora's packaging signing infrastructure. They have a solution called SIGUL. And uh, we're at the moment, we're seeking obviously more people to contribute if they have an interest in this space. Uh, feedback, as I say, we've been pathfinding here as we go along, okay? And there is in fact a uh, open API that is within Recall. So we have like a swagger UI where you can go in and, and see how the, the APIs work. And, and, and you know, if somebody wanted to develop a client, it would be very easy to do that. So every time we make a change to the API, it automatically renders Swagger UI and an open API spec. So we, like I said earlier, we have a CLI, which can do everything that you need to do with the transparency log. But if somebody wanted to integrate into, for example, their build system, a call to Recall, it would be relatively trivial to do because there's a REST API that's available. Uh, if we go to 16, so currently we have, um, Obviously, Red Hat and Google are contributing. And some of you all know Santiago from Intoto. He started to contribute to the project. And he's also managed to get us four undergrads and a PhD student to work on this. So at the moment, we're just talking to um, who we see as experts to, to gain uh, feedback and, and um, impressions and possible contributions. You might have a, a very valid question of why we're talking to the CNCF. So we're not specifically looking, we're not here to seek inclusion into the CNCF. It's not to say we haven't outruled it. We're, we're just sort of making our minds up as we discover and talk to people what would be the best approach. Because this is of course very, um, it, it is cloud native, you know, it can run within that infrastructure, but it could also run on a, a non-cloud machine. And, and be dealing with manifests that are generated outside of a cloud context. So that is essentially um, an overview, just some other things. So this is not just slide where, as I said, we've got a full working solution. Uh, the code is all on GitHub. It's Apache 2 licensed. Uh, we have a Slack channel where people can ask questions and get support. Uh, we have kind of a, an, a website where we're starting to get decent documentation up there and, and the Swagger UI. You can see there, it's an example there. So you've got the API spec, if somebody's interested, where you can try it out. And uh, we'll have be having documentation in there and kind of what is Recore. And we'll also be um, providing a, a sort of a, a directory of servers that people can use. So, you know, there could be multiple Recores in much the same way as there are multiple GPG key servers. So um, I'll conclude there, but I'll, I'll defer to Bob and Dan, just in case I missed anything substantial that I should have mentioned. I think that was good. Cool. Sound good to you, Bob? Yeah, sounds good. I mean, I think the only other thing I would mention is the, you know, we do have thoughts around creating in a kind of going back to the key compromise use case, um, maybe a, even a, something like a Have I Been Pwned website that you mm -hmm. could ultimately upload your public key to and get an email or a webhook fired if if there is, a, you know, an entry added to the log that would that used your public and private key. Um, so in terms of trying to think of this as, again, the, the parallel of Let's Encrypt, um, you know, this is a, a common service for good. Um, and figuring out how, how does this ultimately evolve and adapt to, to the various artifacts that we could generate within the supply chain. I, as Luke said, we're, we're trying to feel that out right now and um, you know just solicit feedback and, and ideas and contributions. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, uh, and along the lines of that, have I been pwned use case? I think you could almost sort of have a project like the Tuff that could benefit from this as well. So if a key compromise was picked up within the transparency log, then Tuff could enact its key compromise resilience and revoke and so forth. And we're sure there's lots of synergies with um, uh, Notary. And we also know Keyline uh, could benefit from the uh, uh, having a, a source of signed digest and so forth. So, so yeah, I think what we could do is open it up to questions if anybody has any. So, yeah, I think um, there's a couple of questions in the chat as well. 
Okay, so uh, this is Faisal. Thank you for the presentation today. Uh, just a couple of uh, small questions. Uh, so my first question is, is your project kind of, I mean, is it a direct replica of CT transparency log? You are trying to do same thing for uh, co uh, code signing or supply chain uh, uh, artifact signing, or is it something additional as well? In, in, in addition to transparency log, does it also provide uh, architecture to sign and verify, or is it just transparency thing that you handle? Uh, this is my first question. My second question is, with uh, with transparency logs, uh, the Google transparency logs, uh, you are only kind of pushing public certificates there or public certificate related data there. Uh, but do you have similar concept that all open source projects will only push the data here? or you want every organization to deploy something internal for transparency? Okay, so I'll take your second question first. Okay. Uh, we're really positioning this as something to, that we want to be beneficial to open source communities, okay? And uh, which in turn benefits us all. Uh, but as said, this can be run internally. So somebody, if somebody wanted to use this within their own a private organization they could and you know if somebody has information that they're willing to share there's nothing to say they can't put it into a public instance as well if it's if it sort of meets that uh, security context and you know and, it, and there's no issues around trust boundaries and then the information being public we could certainly be receptive to that and the first question if yeah i would um, just just to clarify that point a little bit like the log itself is public and all data in it is public. There's no reason you can't store signatures for closed source artifacts. And as long as the artifact and the signature are publicly distributed, that's fine. Um, yeah. It wouldn't make sense, like we were saying, for you know, an artifact you build and run internally that never gets distributed publicly. It wouldn't make sense to stick that metadata in here. But you know, even closed source executables you download um, still need signatures. Uh, and so that's fine. Yeah, good example. Yeah, for example, blobs and so forth. And the uh, the first question. So this was to do with the differences between certificate transparency. So as I said, we share the same back end, but we're totally separate. We wouldn't be running on certificate transparency logs. Uh, we so with Trillion, it has a concept of a personality which is the kind of the application that sits in front of Trillium, okay? And Recall's completely separate code base from project to certificate transparency. We just have a lot of similarities because of the back end and, and the, the sort of signing and storing within a, the transparency log. Thank you, thank you. So let's see what other questions. Um, so address, yeah, that's the right URL, api.recall.dev. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so I can see Bob's been answering some questions there. So it looks like everything's been answered in the chat. Is there anything that anybody wanted to expand upon that's been put into the chat? So I guess I have a question kind of um, hmm. uh, for the team. I, I know that Recall is interfacing with a lot of cloud native technologies, um, like, you know, in total tough um, notary. Is that... Not, not as yet. We do, we are interested in doing that. It's only in total, yes, but with tough and notary, we haven't integrated as such, but, okay. but we were very receptive to that. So, so I guess, yeah, my, my question is around that. Uh, I think um, Justin isn't on today, but is there any communities that you would like to, um, if you're already not in touch with, to get in touch with them and we can help with that? What to be beneficiaries of Recall or to sort of collaborate on Recall? To collaborate. Nobody specifically comes to mind, um, unless Bob, Dan, I, mean, I think Tuff and Notary are, are, are very interested, and Spire, of course, as mentioned earlier. I think there's a lot of 
some really good synergies there as well. Yeah, I can't think of anyone. Um, we're paying attention to the Notary V2 work. I guess mm -hmm. I would say you know, a lot of cloud native projects um, aren't really signing release artifacts today because it's not super easy or possible to do that with container images um, and OCI artifacts. So as that work progresses, I assume more CNCF projects will start signing release artifacts um, as that gets easier. So at that point, we'll want to interact more directly with people. Yeah, and there is kind of the chicken and the egg problem here as well. Is if we don't get communities to to make entries into the log, then we don't ever get the momentum of uh, gravity and, and changing the broader practices uh, in communities around the software supply chain. So I think there's kind of the set of integrations that we could do uh, with other projects versus just users of the log. So I think mm. we'd be seeking both type of uh, interactions here as we go forward. Yeah, very much. Which is kind of why we're conducive to the Let's Encrypt model. Because their, their optics are, it's very much a public good service, if you see what I mean. It's not sort of a case of give your data to Red Hat and Google. It's, it's seen as being something that's wholesome and for the benefit of everybody. And that's that's a kind of, um, that's how we see Recall perhaps stand in a better chance of adoption within the public space. Obviously, internally, there are no considerations there as such around adoption. Yeah, I see Santiago posting something about the um, software supply chain security working group. So, uh, um, yeah, I, yeah, I can you guys hear me? Uh, the, yeah, the yeah, 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 can um, hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that I think uh, that's also a perfect place to tie in uh, the work that's starting to come on software supply chain security working group and uh, projects like Recore that need to. Uh, you know, framing around the threat modeling and the scenarios. Um, the challenges of adoption that uh, Luke was talking about uh, really remind me of the challenges that Jodo has, which is pretty much the supply chain is as weak as its, uh, as its weakest link. And uh, I know it's a very cliche phrase, but like the broader you cover an area, the more secure uh, things are. And uh, that I think it's a, like the important push that I foresee in say 2021 that it's uh, getting the most of open source projects participating so we can start answering questions about the cross-organizational ownership uh, about publication of uh, like trusted artifacts reproducible builds so on and so forth can i make a suggestion i mean i don't know if and again and it's helped us to a certain degree is do some presentations in in some of these projects community meetings like aspire tufts you know notary mm -hmm. to kind of understand like what you all do it's it's amazing after after seeing this but i kind of have to do like an internal kind of sell what you sell like on the on the on the community side so mm -hmm. it'd be awesome to say hey jump in you know whatever you know community out there and say this is what kind of what we do so then it, it it gets the architects and the engineers out there thinking oh i can plug this into blah 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 mm. you know it'd be super useful and I'm, again just kind of the that's a really good point yeah mm. yeah definitely yeah and we would also sort of like to help projects actually sign releases because there's so many that aren't at the moment i mean if we take kubernetes for example none of the releases are signed um, GitHub sort of signs the commits, but then GitHub's keys are not accessible. So all you can really do is rely on, upon a, uh, a sort of a, a JavaScript component with a green tick to show that something's trusted, but you can't actually validate the trust yourself. So we'd also like to, you know, look at ways that we could explore making it easier for software maintainers <laughs> to sign their releases because so many uh, don't at the moment. And, so uh, Cube has an infra team as well as, you know, the mm -hmm. the team that's working through like the releases, right? I mean, that's a perfect mm -hmm. scenario where on a community sure. call of some sorts, jumping on and saying, hey, this is kind of what we do. Yeah. Um, you know, it you know, sometimes you got to give to get, right? So sure, like, sure. you know, yeah. So some yeah. thought there, sorry to cut you off. No, no, I'm just making a note of that. The Kubernetes really was it the release team or the build? There's a there's an infra team as well. Infra um, if, team, sorry. Yeah. So if you go to the you know I think the, the Kubernetes uh, you know, contributors or or it kind of shows all the various SIGs that are there. Great. I think it's, it's great to see these sort of integrations as well, right? Because what, what I'm hoping we can also cover in that the the 
supply chain working group is that sort of broader architecture of how this is all going to fit together. You know, how would the architecture look like if we have Intoto in there, appropriately set up with Intoto and uh, Spire perhaps and uh, and uh, Recall? I think that would be really beneficial to see the, the breadth of what needs to happen to, to provide security within the supply chain and provide those best practices to people. And to Santiago's point, we're starting to show that to some of the open source projects to say, look, this is a best practice uh, approach to building and securing that software. Here's a sample architecture you can use and press a button and add it to your project, right? And then you start to seed that community with something that you use and leverage. Yeah, it's a good point. Totally agree, absolutely. Supply chain working group. So this is under CNCF? And under this group, yeah, the SIG Security Group. We only recently started discussing it last uh, last week, but we're holding the uh, first meeting of that on the 22nd, which is Friday, not tomorrow, like you already said. Great. So I would uh, just just a, a quick point. If you'd like any right away, you think you could get us on to a, a meeting where, you have, where you're able to lodge an entry on an agenda, go for it. Just let us know and, and we'll turn up and, and present. It'll be a privilege. This is basically a working group, Luke, with some of the same people you're talking to, kind of oh, discussing see. these same issues, but sure. more focused on supply chain. I um, see. Okay, makes sense. Awesome. Um, do you have any any more questions? Any other comments? Somewhat anecdotically, from experience maintaining Spire, it's been challenging for us to integrate with single vendor open source projects. Can you share a little bit about your rationale around whether do you pr pursue insertion into CNCF or you do not? What are you contemplating there? What do you, what's your vision for the future? Sure. So, waiting. yeah. So at present, we, I think we, we've, it's fair to say we're multi-vendor. There's not many of us on there, but we've got Red Hat, Google, and Purdo University with Santiago. Around which foundation we will land in, we haven't really made a decision as yet. We, we, we're just sort of um, socializing the technology, and, and we're aware that we will likely fall into some sort of foundation or consortium. But we're sort of open-minded there. We, we intend to just to talk to people and, and what reveals itself to be the best fit would be the best fit effectively. That's cool. Yeah, yeah we certainly found a lot less friction working with other CNCF projects. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, for us, the main thing is like to, to echo back to what we were discussing earlier, which is the optics really. That's what we have to get right. Because as Bob said, it, it's, for us, we're only as useful as the data sets that we have. So we need open source projects to, to submit manifest to us. So that's where I sort of, I know I keep sort of unparroting myself here, but that's where we, the sort of the let's encrypt model as we describe it is, is a good way of rendering that. Yeah, to build on that one, like the, the code is one thing, it's an open source project, but the real benefit here is kind of the operational service. Um, and I know, CNCF operates a couple things like that, kind of like the, the CNCF hub and a few others, um, but making sure that we get that service set up in a sustainable way um, that can be operated uh, reliably is the most important part. Very much, yeah. So that's why we've looked to build an operator so that it's sort of, you know, it can, we can sort of open source the operation of Recall as well, effectively. That's the sort of model that we would like to have so that somebody can, somebody needs to deploy recall, uh, you know, they can do so in a manner that's <coughs> cloud native. and can scale and utilize resources as and how it needs to. Right, it's, it's ultimately about reach and, and distribution and making sure that it's success accessible it is discoverable for people because you want to get those data sets and you want to yes for, very much yeah that's that's where we'll have that's where we'll hold a lot of value for the overall open source ecosystem with all of these 
you know, as we know, there's so many projects that um, that just have a, a very small amount of maintainers on there. You know, they're perhaps not financed by a company, and uh, you know, they've got they've got their own private keys. They're signing things, they're making releases, and and these small projects can be pulled into huge projects in their dependency matrix. And so it's just sort of looking at how we can have some transparency there around um, what's in that ecosystem. So one thing, uh, uh, this is JJ, uh, Lad to, hey, uh, to Andreas comment. Uh, one thing that's um, historically helped projects like this uh, to become a little bit more uh, successful is establish a project plan uh, for your how we are thinking about working with CNCF uh, in a open transparent way and then track to it so it helps people to identify collaborate and uh, interface and contribute <laughs> and you may stick to plan you may not stick to plan but being able to actually establish that and put it out in open uh, will help you get a little more i mean it helps with transparency uh, for sure and it helps you put the intent out there <clears throat> and then it helps other people to identify and be able to associate and collaborate and uh, lend help as they go so understood it's a good point Look, and, and what you said last, really to underline there, that'd be a great benefit to the ecosystem. You'd be boosting a lot of projects. There's even mid-sized projects of corporately employed people that don't do signed releases because they it, it's an operational burden, sure. right? And yeah. they have many maintainers of different companies. How, what sign, kind of signing rituals do they do? How do they manage those keys? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, yes, very much. Yeah, and I think there is a an angle to this where people are nervous to sign things and to provide digests because it almost steps them up as being accountable if something goes wrong. Whereas if they don't involve themselves, they're not putting their reputation at stakes, which is kind of doesn't make sense when you put it apart. But I think that's the sort of psychology that's that's playing out. Quite well, often. build and releases themselves take a lot of dependencies, right? There's a lot of things. And so sure. like, again, there, if I think the, like you said, the mental aspect of it there is, is kind of making sure that people understand that your tool is not going to add a ton of extra overhead it's going to do a certain thing that they can't do that you know you don't want a team to have to build their own kind of signing capability right so it seems like you're, you're building a framework right yes yeah so initially the focus has been on the core technology but you know we would like to make the tooling conducive to help make it easier for people to to sign and, and so for uh, how we do that, I mean, we don't really want to sort of recreate GPG, so we need to sort of weigh up the, what will be the best approach there. But we definitely want to make it easier for people to do this. And one thing that will really help them is knowing that anything that they do produce will be widely available. And others can, others can watch that particular space and audit that space. Would this make make sense to kind of, um, for example, if you could have it as part of like the CI badging, um, because they already have signing kind of like silver, I think the silver CI badge as like signing requirements. So maybe, um, you know, a gold requirement could be you would upload your sign manifest to a transparency server as well. It is, yeah. I mean, I've I've never seen that bigger adoption around the badge program. But um, it is I know when we're doing the when we're doing the security assessments, we kind mm. of part of it is we also map it to the CI badging. Oh, okay. So for yeah. CNCF projects for security assessments. That's a very of, good point. Yeah. And the, the the projects in the Open SSF now, so yeah. I think uh, we could talk to the working group there because we plan to talk to them at some point as well.
Awesome. So um, I guess to, to, to round it up, um, recall.dev, that's all you have to remember. On there, you can find the GitHub organization. Uh, there is a Slack channel. I don't know if I've got a Slack invite on there. If not, somebody, you'll find me in the CNCF channel. I'm usually hanging around the Keyline channel. And um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you want to stand something up, it's worth touching base with us because things are moving fast at the moment. So docs are catching up. So it's, uh, if you know, don't do get in contact with us and, and uh, we can help you stand up an instance and, and play with it and make some entries, do some inclusion proofs, that sort of thing. So I'll be interested in that Slack channel if uh, you get a link to that. Maybe I can do that now quickly. Yeah, just uh, well, Lou, chat. could you could you put the um, put the slides as well as the section sure. in the issue? Um, at least we have it preserved somewhere that it's accessible. Will do. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll just quickly grab the invite, but I'll put it into the. Um, I'll drop it into in. the chat. Great, thank you, Bob. Luke, what do you have behind you? Carbon tubeless, wireless shifters? This Carbon. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I don't know much about bikes. So I should get on it more. I tend to run more. It's Lapierre, if that means anything. But it is, it's carbon. Yeah. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thanks, yeah. Luke. Thanks, Bob. Okay, and yeah. Dan. No, thank, thank you so much for your time, everybody. And really good to to catch up take care thank really you. interesting thanks thank you bye-bye see you next week or oh, friday at the the software supply chain working group yeah i will i'll, I'll, I'll come along to that That's maybe good. brandon you could ping me the uh yeah i'll send you i'll send you a link fantastic thank you everybody thank you bye-bye bye. 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 cheers oh, i guess meeting adjourned I thought Luke was leaving, not just everyone else. Hey, Santiago, are you joining that call Friday? Yes, I am. Uh, did I not confirm? Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen the invite. I'm just, I was wondering if you're going to be there. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's a bit super hectic. Uh, I had a family member in the hospital and then I'm ah. starting teaching this, uh, some, this week. So it's been like, uh, super crazy, but yeah, I'll see you on Friday. Cool. Your place looks different from last time we spoke. This is my office in the university. Oh, nice. Yeah. Are you all alone on campus? I'm sorry. Are you all alone on campus? Is it like a ghost campus? It ish. I think there's some students. Definitely not a lot of faculty. Um, but I teach today and Monday, so uh, I think everybody just comes when they need to teach. Cool. Well, hopefully your uh, relative recovers and everything's fine. And talk to you Thank Friday. You. Uh, I'll see you Friday then.